Hello everybody, I'm Gwen Campbell Mendes. Welcome to Gwen's Bookish Ramblings. And so, still on vacation, so I'm still working through the Enchanted Forest Chronicles. Um, so last week I talked about uh, Talking to Dragons, which, as I said last week, is the first book in the series chronologically, uh, not chronologically, it's the first book in the series that was written by Patricia Reed. Well, in 1990, she put out a book in the series that is set um, all the way back at the beginning of the series of events that culminated in Talking to Dragons. Um, now, the thing about this first book um, is that in Talking to Dragons, in the last chapter, there's this couple of paragraphs in which Daystar explains all of the stuff that happened that led up to Simmerine handing him a sword at the start of Talking to Dragons and saying, go forth and find stuff. Um, that is, there's five paragraphs that cover a whole whack of things. And there are a whole whack of things that you get the feeling that either Patricia Reedy or someone she knows looked at the uh, l looked at that final couple of paragraphs and said that those paragraphs and said there's a novel in here maybe even more than one and so in 1990 she released or rather published this book dealing with dragons which is the first book in the series chronologically speaking that is this is the book that where everything starts this is the book where Daystar's mother, Simmerine, as he explained at the end of Talking to Dragons, um, runs away and becomes a dragon's princess. Um, so, this particular book, um, this particular book is covered by uh, let's see. Apparently, Mother really was a princess. She was the youngest daughter of the ruler of a very large kingdom on the other side of the Mountains of Morning, and she'd thought it was boring, so she ran away and became Kazul's princess. Kazul wasn't king of the dragons then. She and Mother got along very well, and after a while, Kazul started teaching her dragon magic. And then the wizards helped someone poison the old king of the dragons, and all the dragons went to the Fort of Whispering Snakes to try and move Colin Stone, and Kazul was the one who did. Practically, the first thing Kazul did after she became king was to kick the wizards out of the Mountains of Mourning, which made the wizards plenty mad. That, that is, in, that is in the last chapter of Talking to Dragons, and that is Dealing with Dragons, in a nutshell. Now, Dealing with Dragons um, and the next two sequels, Searching for Dragons and Calling on Dragons, all have... Um, a much closer connection to one of the predominant themes in this book, and that is that this is a reality where fairy tales are not merely true stories, they're how the world functions. Now, Mercedes Lackey has a series that involves that, but her series is a lot darker than this because her series involves some kind of mystical, magical force that effectively manipulates people and changes their personalities actively into doing things. In dealing with dragons and the following sequels, what you get is you have you have a universe where some of this is it wouldn't be seemly, it wouldn't be proper for a uh, princess to marry somebody who hasn't rescued her from a dragon, which is one of Simmerine's last-ditch attempts to not marry the Prince Therondil when her parents tell her that she's going to marry him next Thursday. Um, or, no, it was a week from Thursday, pardon me. Um, but, so, the, there is, of course, the issue that it wouldn't be proper, it wouldn't be proper for the djinn who escapes from a bottle and threatens to kill Cimmerine and uh, Therondil, only it turns out that he was released during the wrong hundred years, but no one ever releases a djinn during the any anything but the last hundred years. So, um, you know, he should kill her and 
you know, Therindil says, yeah, but you swore to grant whoever released you during the second hundred years, you swore to grant them three wishes, not to kill them. So, you know, you can't do that. Um, in this case, um, however, there are other issues. Like, when... Cimmerine first meets one of her fellow princesses because dragons just collectively keep princesses as minor signs of status, as very, very unusual housekeepers. Um, when she meets Alianora, Alianora tells her that, you know, the trouble all started when the, when the wicked fairy showed up for my christening. And she cursed you? No. She... Dang, she drank punch and ate ice cream until she never burst and danced with my Uncle Arthur until three in the morning and had a fantastic time and left without cursing me. Well, the thing is that, yes, of course, the, you know, there are things that are done and not done, but the physics of the universe seem to have worked around Alianora because the, because she wasn't wasn't given a christening curse and so you know she's locked in a room with straw and told to weave it to spin it into gold and she says but all i could manage was linen thread and whoever heard of a princess who could spin gold into linen th spin straw into linen thread now i don't know which fairy tale that is um, which, by the way, is one of the other fun things to do with this whole series, is to say, is to play Spot the Fairy Tale. Um, but, you know, the, the idea is that a princess, it's fundamental to a princess's makeup that she is able to spin straw into gold. That's just a thing that's part of a princess's capabilities and skill sets, which is is weird unless it's part of the function of the universe. Um, you know, so this is a universe where magic makes up part of the fabric of reality, and magic means that there are some things that physically should be done or can be done or can't be done because that's just how the magic works. And... You know, and you get, and so you get things like Alianora is given a couple of, is given a glass slippers and a beautiful gown and told to go to a ball and land a prince, and she breaks the slippers before she even gets out the front door, and Cimmerine says, well, yes, but that's because glass slippers are for deserving merchants' daughters. You know, there are rules. There are these rules about how things work, and it makes such an interesting back and forth between free will and and a discussion about what about what makes a person into a princess about so many things i mean this book and and that's what's so interesting about the world of this book is just taking it apart to figure out how much how much agency, how much free will there is as compared to, you know, the, the fact that there are things that you just can't do because the universe works that way. Um, the other thing in this book, though, is that it's funny. And it's, very, and it's a wry sort of funny. Um, and so when you... And, and so it's... It's got all these little side observations and and unusual side notes that just make it very, very amusing, such as this opening paragraph, that Linderwall was a large kingdom just east of the Mountains of Morning, where philosophers were highly respected and the number five was fashionable. And that right there is sort of... In a lot of ways, it's the mood of the book in a nutshell. It's this perfectly rational, reasonable introduction. It's descriptive. And then you have just something weird. The number five was fashionable. How does a number get to be fashionable? How do you decide that any given number is going to be in fashion or out of fashion? 
and you know and and as you continue through this book you get these you you get all of these things that Semarine is taught and she goes and then bullies the arms master into giving her fencing lessons and going to the uh, and going to the court magician to be taught magic and being told by her parents that it isn't done because it isn't proper. But at the same time, Cimmerine has a fairy godmother that she can just summon who appears in a poof of scented blue smoke. It, it, and so it's, it's always, it, and so it's a very funny book. It's got the amusement of dealing with people like Prince Therondil, who is somewhat well-meaning, not particularly bright, and a very, very stereotypical Prince Charming with no personality. Um, and that winds up being contrasted with the sudden appearance of one of the other prin uh, of the three of the other princesses being held captive by dragons, so to speak. And when she first meets them, Princess Caradwell declares to her that we have made the perilous journey through the tunnels to see the Princess Simmery newly come to these caverns to comfort her and together bemoan our sad and sorry fates. Tell her we are here. And... And she talks like that all the time. And it's a very, very odd contrast with the rest of the book because she's speaking in this pseudo-archaic, pseudo-fancy uh, linguistic construction. I am remiss in my duties, for I have not yet told you who we are. I am the Princess Caradwell of the Kingdom of Raxwell, now captive of the, captive of the dread dragon Gornul. This... She nodded toward the princess in the silver crown as the princess Helena of the kingdom of, kingdom of Poran, both now captive of the dread dragon Zareth, and this, she waved at the girl in the pearl circlet, is the princess Alianor of the duchy Turon Marsh, now prisoner of the dread dragon Warog. And Cimmerine introduces herself and goes on with, What sort of tea would you like? I have blackberry, ginger, chamomile, and gunpowder green. I'm afraid I used the last of Lapsang Suchong this morning. It's... It's this strange contrast, and this is a book of strange contrasts. And, as I said, these moments of in-jokes. How are you going to open it? Like this, said Kazul, by night and flame and shining rock, open thou thy hidden lock, Aberol and Garn. That's a very unusual opening spell. It wasn't always that complicated, Kazul said. She sounded almost apologetic. I believe the first version was a very simple, just open sesame, but word got around and we had to change it. It it goes on like that. These alternations between serious, you know, stock J.R. Tolkien-style fantasy and fairy tales and high melodrama and blatant silliness. Um, these these contrasts of realism and fairy tale of of high drama and practicality they make up the book and they make up the humor of this book um so this cover is obviously princess simmerine who unlike a proper princess is tall and unlike a pl proper princess, has black hair, because we all know that the only princess who's supposed to have black hair is Snow White, because, you know, skin is white as snow, hair is, well, hair is black as coal, or dark as raven's wing, or whatever. Depends on the variation you're reading, of course. Um, I think the one thing I don't like about this cover is that Kazul's head there's a tongue sticking out, and I don't know what's going on with those. Those are like dragon dog ears. Anyways. Um, so, this is the first book in the series, and my probably second favorite book. And I think that's everything, so I will see you all with the next book next week.